Welcome back to the Bible study. We just got done with our couple prayer time, had some good prayer time about things in our life and about the study tonight and just uh, looking for, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about is, you know, sometimes, uh, I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes if like tonight it's fairly late and, you know, I'm been up since 1.45 in the morning <laughs> and you can start feeling tired and you start like, I don't know if I want to do this or not. If I feel like I feel, I don't know if I'm too tired, but for me, once you get into it and start getting into God's word and see the things he's bringing out and everything, it kind of energizes you. And, and you're like, afterwards, you're like, man, I'm glad we did that. Mm -hmm. I remember <laughs> that a lot of times whenever we used to do like Wednesday night church, especially when I worked full time and then would do church after work, um, would be tired. And then I was in missionettes. And so I was, you know, like a... You were in charge. Yeah. And so you're, you know, you've got to be on your A game and you're teaching and, you know, that kind of thing. But anyway, um, but I would always be glad at the end of the night that I had done it and that there is that surge of energy until Thursday morning rolls. Then you're a well, little Well, it, it made, <laughs> made me think about when we were doing our virtual church gathering too. I know I felt that a lot of times like oh man I'm tired but afterwards and during you're like this is good this is good stuff mm -hmm. feeding on the word of God I'm hungry spiritually How about you? feeding <laughs> yeah so uh, yeah actually you know it's kind of interesting because last time we were talking we were reading about the kingdom of God and the Lord not partaking in the meal again until after the kingdom of God comes and and however it said that in there and I brought up the point that you know sometimes God works it all together where like sometimes in your prayer time afterwards during the week your personal prayer time he'll bring some stuff out to you and so he kind of did for you this last week about that subject, yeah I right? was thinking about it and um I kind of felt bad because in our last Bible study, I didn't really feel like just looking at this text that I had anything and I didn't feel like I had any particular wisdom. <laughs> so I was like, Lord, I feel bad about that. Like, what, what are your thoughts about that? You know, how do I rightly think about the kingdom of God? And, you know, and so then I feel like the Lord reminded me about how John the Baptist uh, he would, um, in his ministry, would say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And then, as we talked about in Luke 17, how he says the kingdom of, of heaven. I think it says the kingdom of heaven. Does it say the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God? I'm trying Which, to remember. It's like, um, I think, Matthew's gospel because he, he was um, preaching toward the um, Israel, right? And so they they wouldn't say God, I think. So they would say the kingdom of um, heaven. And I don't know if you can hear that. Our heater just came on. I forgot to turn that off so there's no extra audio noise. But um, I think it, it, it varies uh, kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. Okay. Do you remember anything like that? Um, well, I mean, I understand what you're saying. I'm pretty sure that um, John the Baptist said the kingdom of heaven is near, was how he phrased it there, if I remember right. Um, but at any rate, so going back, so the Lord reminded me about that, about John the Baptist, and then reminded me about um, Luke 17 where he says, that the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is in you. And then it, it made me think about that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, perhaps is, well, at one point I was thinking Jesus, but I think, I think it might actually specifically be the Holy Spirit because I was thinking about how in Jesus' ministry, 
he definitely had the Holy Spirit leading and guiding him and the Holy Spirit allowed him to be one with the Father and he prayed that we would be one the Father and just before he ascended to heaven he cautioned the his disciples to not leave Jerusalem until he sent them the Holy Spirit and so therefore the kingdom of heaven is in us and so I was so that's my take at this point is that I'm thinking that that is the Holy Spirit and so um, and so in verse in chapter 22 verse 18 where he says for I tell you from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes then I was also thinking in verse 20 he says this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you um, and so when he is crucified, resurrected, and ascends to heaven, there's a new, there's a new covenant there and he sends us his Holy Spirit. You know, before it's in Old Testament times, the Holy Spirit is said to be hovering over the earth and responsible to lead mankind to do what the father directs to be done and the holy Which is what spirit we were seeing in our study on the holy spirit right and then the holy spirit directed jesus and his ministry and then he sent the holy spirit to us to again lead us in continued ministry here you know and so um anyway those are my thoughts which brought me right back to to actually Matthew in the Great Commission where he says all authority Jesus speaking all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age Which again, speaking of the Holy Spirit, the new covenant where his true followers are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit until the end of the age. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So yeah, okay. So it's cool, you know, she experienced that on what we were looking at last week. So this week, we're gonna pick up where we left off, which is in 24, Luke 22, 24. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and where does your break at after that? And after the first, it goes 30, from, uh -huh. yeah. 24 to 30, <laughs> yeah. All right, you want to start reading tonight? Sure. Let's see what God's going to show us tonight. <laughs> and, you know, actually, one of the things, other things that I was thinking, um, where we, where God had a start, where we picked up, where we had left off with our virtual church gathering study on discipleship, where we left off and where we started here, I think are things that, you know, there's a lot of things that I've kind of really looked into and, and and dug into in God's Word. But some of the things here, like end time things and stuff like that, are things that um, personally I have not really dug into really deep and things like that. So it's not like we're coming across things that like, you know, I've really thought about this and really feel like God's taught me stuff. It's kind of like kind of new territory we're treading on in in mm -hmm. so far since we've been doing these anyway i just was remembering that so i'll go ahead and let you read now <laughs> all righty then all right so starting in verse 24 then a dispute also arose among them about who should be considered the greatest but he said to them the kings of the gentiles lorded over them 
and those who have authority over them have themselves called benefactors. It is not to be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever is greatest among you should become like the youngest, and whoever leads like the one serving. For who is greater, the one at the table or the one serving? Isn't it the one at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. You are those who stood by me in my trials. I bestow on you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, <laughs> and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Hmm, that's interesting. He start he starts going into this eating and drinking at his table in the kingdom. The, the first thing that was coming to me, you know, isn't that the world's way and unfortunately moved into what is considered the church these days um, concerning about who's the greatest and lording over people. What I thought was interesting is that if you go back to verse 23, where we ended last week, the the verse just in front of that says, so they began to argue among themselves which of them it could be who was going to do it, which is, betray he's talking Jesus. about betraying him. Yeah. So it's like in one verse, they're arguing who's going to betray him. And then in the very next verse, they're arguing who's considered the greatest, the greatest, which if I remember right, this isn't the only time they've argued amongst themselves of who was going to be the greatest. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it's um, in another gospel probably because it was with Jesus. I mean, it just, I don't know. I think what I was thinking about is how as humans and, and I was thinking about this as sort of, separate but still aligned I was noticing in the Psalms I've been reading the Psalms in my personal reading and it's interesting how one Psalm can be like God you're so good you're so faithful everything's so awesome and then in the very next Psalm it's like my enemies are all over me you gotta help me hear me and it was like I mean we just kind of flip-flop as humans you know what I mean? And so it's like one minute we're like, hey, who's going to betray you? And then the next minute it's like, oh, who's the greatest? Now that we know he's the worst, who's the greatest? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just... Well, yeah, almost <laughs> kind of like begin to question among themselves which one it might be that, who would do this. Well, let's, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about who's going to be the greatest. <laughs> Well, they already finished that. <laughs> they already knew who was, I don't know, or was it? No, I can't. Question remember. among themselves which of them it might be. Oh, that's who true. Would do he this. hasn't said yet. So maybe, they, maybe yeah. they're kind of, well, let's not talk about this. Let's talk about <laughs> who's going to be the greatest. <laughs> I don't know. It just, I don't know. I, I think I can see myself, you know, one minute, you know, I can be the same way. It's like, God, you're awesome. And then the next minute, like, ah! <laughs> when he says, you know, um, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, uh, and those who exercise authority call themselves benefactors, which I'd probably have to look up benefactors. Do you have a definition on that? Well, people who benefit would be the... Authority over them. Who call themselves benefactors. Lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves So a benefactor, a person who gives money or other help to a person or cause. So are they they're so they're saying these people owe them something because they've done something for them oh that makes sense mm -hmm. so a couple things i'm thinking so the gentiles the, the world outside of god's kingdom out of, outside of god's ways um i kind of think about that because i think i've heard about it more than once a pastor saying they'll go to some 
pastor convention and the number one thing that the pastors are asking or talking to each other about are how many people do you have at your church? Oh. And thinking how so many things are that way these days, like with the internet, you know, how many followers do you have? How many subscribers do you have? How many mm. likes do you get? How many views do you get? You know, wow, I get this many. And and it's kind of just this, this human thing that I think the Lord wants to get us to think a different way. Think, think a different way than trying to figure out how you can lift yourself up and be greater than somebody else. Yeah. That's kind of interesting, though. I think sometimes in past Bible studies, we've talked about Western culture, you know, like pursuing the American dream and like you were just saying, you know, getting the most likes and views and comments and, you know, all that kind of stuff um, on social media. Um, and yet, um, I forget, I just lost my thought of where <laughs> that I was happened going, to me last time, where I was going with that, but, um, I guess, I guess I'm just saying that instead of that being really a cultural thing, I think that's just a human thing. Like that's where I was going with that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, with all the other nations, with the totalitarian rule, I mean, they seek after having complete control over people and mm -hmm. how everything seems to, you know, even in our country right now, it's there's a big push and move toward controlling everything in people's lives, whether you can go to work or not, or whether you can go to a church building or not, or whether... Um, you can go outside, you have, you know, with the pandemic, it was a bit, there was a big thing of control there. And it just seems like there's this big push for that totalitarian type of rule that seems to take over everywhere. So here's what, um, my study note says in here, um, Says the wording in these verses is significantly different than that in Matthew 20, 25, 28, which is again in, in Matthew, they're arguing amongst themselves who's the greatest. Oh, okay. Suggesting that the <clears throat> apostles argued about greatness more than once. Greatness of the world is based on power and public recognition, just like what you're saying. But Christ taught that spiritual greatness requires humility and self sacrifice. Jesus is our example because he came among us as the one who serves. And, you know, thinking about it, you know, how, how did he serve? He served mostly the serving the best thing that he could serve was teaching people about okay. and inviting people into the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and, and that's the thing, you know, in our, in our Western modern American church lens that we have, we've been trained to see that serving as running and funding a building um, services and programs that that is ours, but you, you if the Bible was all we had, we would never come up with that. We would never come up with that. Because as, as I look today, you know, as it was kind of interesting. Um, I think it was yesterday in my reading, looking up when the first Christian church buildings were built, and it was about 300 A.D., 300 years after Christ, and I know some of that was because they were being persecuted and they couldn't build buildings, but they didn't even build any buildings. They It, it was a lifestyle. It was living together and seeking after God together with the church being people. 
and it wasn't until 300 years after Christ before what they know of the first church building was built and just you know and, and like I was talking to you earlier I mean you know I mean it's nice you, you have comfortable seats you have nice bathrooms you got good sound systems and lighting and all this stuff but thinking about how it changes so much if it becomes centered on a building spent you know having millions of dollars in debt and all this work that needs to be done for this building that is pretty much empty all week except for maybe two days a week and, and that only for like an hour and a half at a time how much how much more could we do if we were just living our lives and helping people that need help within the church like we see in, in God's word you know the times that they gave under the new covenant was that we see was for um, some believers in Jerusalem another town that were being persecuted providing their needs for them they all got together and gave for that And if how much more money we would have to help people out in that way. So what do you think these verses are telling us? Oh yeah. <laughs> well, we got we got to the um, you know, and unfortunately, I guess part of that with the modern American church and the building and everything, it sets people up on a pedestal and makes them like people's boss. The one that you look to that kind of, I don't know, it, it just kind of changes things. And he's telling us here that we're not to do that. I think too, even if you're, um, you can still be humble in beginning your service, but it, it starts to feel good what you're doing. And sometimes, well, I mean, it should feel good, but anyway. And so sometimes you can get elevated because of how good it feels. Yeah. But you have to remember, I mean. And I it think, can be addictive. Yeah. But I, I think it's important, you know, the verses he says, you know, for who is greater, the one at the table or the one who is serving? Isn't it the one at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. And so, you know, He's that's, the Lord. Mm -hmm. And whatever we're doing, we're supposed to be doing it as unto the Lord anyway. Um, but it can be easy to get caught up in, even when you start your service with, the right mind and the right intentions yeah you can get a little caught up in the like oh this is awesome which it is awesome but you got to remember okay i'm you know it's the one at the table Feels good being it yeah it's the one at the table that's the important right and who are, and i mean that's just a an analogy but yeah well yeah and, and you think about you know in the other place where um Jesus is talking about the the Pharisees teachers of the law and Sadducees how they want to have uh, what how does he say it the the best seat the important mm -hmm. seat in the synagogues like being and being acknowledged yeah which is a human that is a human tendency to want to be acknowledged to want to be appreciated to want to be blah 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 which I think is why he's addressing it there because because he sees the disciples falling into it right there. And so we need um, we need God's strength to not fall into that temptation, which, you know, bottom line, if you think about it, that was Lucifer's issue. Yeah. He got upset because... That's true. He knew he was beautiful. He knew that he was smart and intelligent powerful and powerful. And, and 
hey, it, it got to I can be head. God. And, and that's the biggest, the biggest <laughs> downfall of us humans is we get to wanting to be God. That we and we want to believe God, what God we, of our own but lives. We may not say that. Yeah. But when we get to, I want to believe what I want to believe. I want to. Yeah. I want to believe what feels good to me. I want, you know, and and yeah. I mean, it, it can happen to anybody. Because, I mean, I say it more than once, you know, I had the chance to become a professional skateboarder and potentially in one of the biggest skateboard um, companies that there was. It was right before that that I get invited as a, a real big professional was telling me that he wanted to get me on a team because we skated together and things, I kind of went down a different road um after that and and i think back on it and i just thank god thank god because if i would have had money back then and and fame and everything i probably would not be here today because mm, where i was at that time would not have been able to handle it i just would have went full on partying and doing all kinds of things that i probably would not be here today so I, I I know it's it's like such a temptation and hard thing for us humans um, you know and that's Satan's first thing Satan's first thing and we see him doing in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve oh no 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 did God really say to get us to question God, to think that we might know more than God or he's holding out on us? And if you do this, you can be like God. It's like, ooh. So, I think it's, and you see, unfortunately, so many of these, these pastors and these leaders that have these huge followings and these huge platforms falling because it, it goes to their head and they start thinking too highly of themselves. So it's, we definitely, <laughs> like you said, we definitely need God's help to keep our feet on the ground. <laughs> to be grounded in Him. And the one who rules like the one who serves. Which is basically putting others before yourself. Yeah. The others are um, not more important, but like I, I saw something. It's not, it's not a biblical statement, but I think it's based on biblical principles where it's talking about the best leaders are those who who care about those they're leading. Like that's their focus, not how am I leading or what am I? I mean, that's a component of it. But oh, I look how but it, right. And what it, are people thinking about me? But it's more <clears throat> that who who are those that I'm leading, and how can I encourage them in what we're doing together whatever that is whether that's a work environment a ministry environment a community environment whatever environment if you can look to and and even if you're not leading i mean if you're just um i guess as a christian we're always leading in one sense if you think about it whether we're in the leader position or not we're supposed to be leading towards Christ. So representatives of if this. we look, you know, if if our focus is more on like how can I, you know, help them grow spiritually, mentally, physically. And it's not always a feel good thing because as we see through a lot of the Bible, um bringing people to a place of repentance is not always not always a feel good thing but like like he's doing here 
he's he's getting them to see that they're thinking wrongly and you need to change that if but you, it's interesting how he says it though because he doesn't he doesn't like chastise them he doesn't really i mean obviously you can tell that the subject is brought up because they're arguing amongst themselves about who's the greatest one but he doesn't talk to them specically he he shares the good news like this story. is good news right but he, he mm -hmm. shares a story or what have you and he lets the holy spirit cast the stone as it were you know <laughs> what i'm saying like you can't really bring somebody to repentance i think you they have to choose oh yeah to come to repentance and i think that's important it's between them and god in in communicating with people um in discipleship if you i think if um if you can share a story and i think it's even more touching if you share it from from your own personal experience because i think you can share it with a lot more detail and a lot more uh tangibleness for somebody to understand and relate to um but anyway well I, I think one of the things like kind of what where i was talking about that is like he's he's willing to say hard things and lead them away from wrong thinking into right thinking as opposed to a lot of christianity today it's like hey come to god and he's going to do this for you you come to God and he's going to give you this. He's going to fix your marriage. He's going to heal your body. He's going to do this. He's going to, and all this feel good stuff that people are kind of thinking they're coming to God, but they're like coming to God like spoiled children. That they just want God to do more and give them this and do that and get this and rather than kind of seeing our our need for God not just how he can give us more or do more stuff for us see understanding who God is and how amazing he is and desiring to come to him whether he's going to do anything else for us or not I mean he's given us eternal life a way to become right with him a way to become saved from our sins I think I think there's truth in that but I also find it industry interesting that in verse 30 actually it starts in verse 29 so even though they've been arguing about who's going to betray him they're arguing about and not oh, just yeah. the first time but the second time arguing about who's the greatest, which sort of goes to one of the study notes, um, talks about their immaturity in the disciples. But even still, starting in verse 29, Jesus says, I bestow on you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. I mean, <laughs> even still, with their immaturity and their lack of arrival to some... And, and you know, the interesting thing is, thinking about it, is like, you, you don't go in there trying to set yourself up as... Um, sitting on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. You humble yourselves and be servants, and that's where you're going to be. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't get that by trying to set yourself up that way and, and put yourself above other people, that you humble yourself and be a servant and just caring enough about other people that they are able to come into the kingdom of God too. That reminds me of a verse in James where 
um, talking about, um, I think the, the analogy was like a wedding or some sort of an event and it says, don't, don't seat yourselves in the choice. Oh yeah. Spot, As the Pharisees do, does but, he say that but there? But set yourself back and let your, um, I forget what the host first, or something yeah, yeah, yeah. bring you up to the better seat up to the better seat and that's exactly what this kind of describes too they set themselves down on the servant seat mm -hmm. not the one at the table and Jesus comes in and sets them on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel mm -hmm. yeah Ra rather than like the story you're talking about jump up there and get in the seat of honor mm -hmm. so that everybody can see you sitting there and then like, somebody wait, more important oh, comes in. Uh, that's right. That's right. I forgot about that. That was another part of the verse in James. And then, because you don't want to be embarrassed by told, oh, excuse me, sir, but um, this isn't your seat. Yours is back there. <laughs> and then in front of everybody, you see yourself get... Yeah. Get yourself... <laughs> But it's much, but, back it, in but your it place. looks much better to have, um, you know, somebody bring you from the back and bring up to the front. Then everybody sees you being, you know, brought in front and you're just kind of like, okay, yeah. <laughs> but how, you know, how much, how much is it that, you know, like you're talking about human nature that we want to, we want to get up in that, we want to go right up into that seat of honor. <laughs> and so everybody could see us sitting there and like, um wow look at look at him or look at her anyway that's some good stuff yeah i feel like i feel like i have more talk to talk about on this one than some of the what we've been going through where it's more like contemplation and like god okay <laughs> what some of the this stuff here can really kind of relate to Mm -hmm. but yeah that's kind of interesting <laughs> first they began to question among themselves which which of them it might be who would do this betray jesus oh wait a minute let's let's talk about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom and jesus says you know that's kind of what the gentiles the world outside of god's kingdom does and so you need to bring yourself down don't be taking the seat of honor. Don't be trying to set yourself up above people and get recognition and all that. And when you come into my kingdom, you know, those are the seats that you're going to have. You're going to have them anyway. You don't need to try to take them. Yeah. You know, you know I mean? And that's the one that matters. Not mm -hmm. here in this world that's that's decaying and fading away. Mm -hmm. This is a this is the kingdom that's going to last for all of eternity. So, John, who ended up being the greatest? <laughs> uh, funny. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, I know. God's word never passes away. Everybody knows about that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anything else in that? Mm-mm. -mm. Not for me anyway. We want to go on to the next part. Yeah, and so in mine, 31. 31 to oh. 34, it looks like. Oh, yeah, there's going to be another little plot shift here, isn't it? I think so. Okay, so I'll, to 34, yours goes to. Okay, yeah, yours breaks it up into mm -hmm. a lot smaller bite-sized pieces here. All right, so are you... Uh, so after that, after him telling them that uh, so that you may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, 
you will you will deny me three you will deny three times that you know me is that where yours ends yeah okay i think it's interesting something that's always stood out to me um so when he says simon simon look out satan has asked to sift you like wheat which reminds me of job where um it starts out um hold on a second I'm oh yeah there. uh i'm almost there hold on hold on bear with me um In, in chapter 1, starting at verse 6, I believe, he's, uh, he says, One day the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. And the Lord asked Satan, Where have you come from? From roaming through the earth, Satan answered him, and walking around on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Anyway, the part that it has always kind of tweaked my little brain is um, that Satan is in heaven with God and they're having a conversation about Job. And, and so that's Old Testament. And then here you are in New Testament. Jesus says that Satan has asked to sift and Simon is Peter. So sift Peter like wheat. And so is all this time until Jesus returns that Satan is able is is still even though he's been tossed from heaven right he's a fallen angel that he still has access yeah, the thing I was thinking of wondering if like in the spiritual world it's not like the physical world where um he has to like go there or something i don't know so this is interesting my study note here says in these verses jesus addressed simon peter as the leader of the apostles and their spokesman the plural you indicates satan wanted to sift all the apostles like wheat a rough action that symbolizes tempting them to spiritual ruin Peter protested that nothing would cause him to deny Jesus, but Jesus knew better. When you have turned back demonstrates that Jesus also knew that Peter's denial would be temporary and that he would play a significant role in church history. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. I mean, a couple of things like um, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. And then Jesus says, but I have prayed for you, Simon that your faith may not fail, that Jesus is praying for Simon, mm -hmm. which is interesting that he, um, well, it talks about him praying, but that, that Jesus, the Son of God, God himself, is praying. And then, yeah, like it said in the note, that was another thing that stood out to me. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Mm -hmm. He knows he's going to turn back. He knows he's going to he's going to um, deny him. He knows he's going to turn back. So he tells him the whole story, what's going to happen right there, and tells him what to do after he turns back. Peter, Simon, in his humanness there, but he replied, Lord, I am ready to go to go with you to prison and to death. <laughs> no, you're not. A <laughs> <laughs> yeah, little servant girl. He denies Jesus too. Mm -hmm. Which But through that, it's just so amazing to me. Like God knows us so intimately, knows our frailties so intimately, and yet still continues to encourage us. I mean, Jesus is praying over us, right? And, and you know, honestly, Satan wants to sift all of us like wheat. 
quite frankly. He wants to send wants us, to take all us out to spiritual ruin. And yet, you know, Jesus is like, you know what? You keep your eyes on me. I got you. I, I know the end of the story. I got you. I know the end, of, not only of the story, I know the end of your story. And, and that's one of the things, too, that, you know, Satan, he doesn't play fair and he doesn't play the way he does in the movies. He can. He's, he's evil, but he's a deceiver. So one of I think one of his biggest things is to get people to think that they're right with Jesus and let them go to church and everything and think, you know, hey, I'm going to church every Sunday. I'm good. And I think that's probably one of, well, you know, pastor has even said before that busloads of people that go to church are going to be taken to hell. And that should be concerning. <laughs> It should be concerning that, you know, do we really know the Jesus of the Bible or are we, do we know a Jesus, a twisted version of Jesus? Which I think it's so important to be in God's word to see what, what God actually says. And, you know, if, if somebody's teaching, we should go to God's word and really make sure what we're being taught is lines up with what God's word says. Because like, you know, even um, talking about the Bereans, that the, the Bereans were more, no, no, were more noble than another group because they searched the scriptures daily to see if what Paul, the apostle Paul, was teaching them was true or not. Um. So I was just thinking like two thoughts pop in my head. Now I have to remember what those two thoughts were. Um, one, uh, in thinking about Satan, um, I believe he only has power from two sources. One, what God allows him to do. And two, what we allow him to do. That was my first uh, thought. And then the second part, is um, although I'm sure that God wants us to grow in spiritual maturity, I see in this passage. Number one, He, he knows, knows the end. He knows the end of our story, but yet He's so gracious to say, "I still have." beautiful things for you in heaven when you get there regardless of where you are spiritually i i believe i'm i don't god is not a you have to arrive to come to me and you know whether you're coming to him here on earth or you're coming to him in heaven um because once we're in heaven it's going to be a whole new ball game once we get there here on earth i think he realizes that we stump ourselves we sometimes lack within ourselves the ability to like get it <laughs> to, to grasp concepts um and so Jesus, his, his comments are you still so dull yes you don't get it yet yes i am <laughs> and so here you know i just think that yes i'm sure that god like any parent wants their children to get it but he is so proud of us. He loves us so much. And he's so in our court, whether we get it or not. As long as our focus is on him, you know, as long as we're trying to be in a relationship with him, understand what that is, time with him, we're gonna walk get it. that out, I think he is gracious to move us through wherever we are in the journey, as long as we keep our eyes on him not on ourselves, not on the things of this earth, which is, that can be, that can be hard because sometimes you can feel like you're in the world, but, um, but then all of a sudden you, you turn to the left or the right and all of a sudden you are of the world and not just in the world. And that can be a vast difference. It's hard to be in a world and be set aside when everybody else set apart, set apart, set aside, 
man. <laughs> tomato, tomato. Um, to it, it's it's hard. It you know, it's those you know those little signs with the Dalmatian with the colored spots, right? It's it's hard set apart in a world where it's one size fits all. It's trying to find your normal or the normal or determine what's normal. But God has created us to be unique, individual, set apart individuals, which means we are going to look different, smell different. Set and we need for him. And we need to be okay with that. And a lot of times that does not feel comfortable. And so that can be really challenging because you want to just kind of like fit into the pattern of the wallpaper behind you, but we're not called you don't to do that. Stand out, and yeah. People not like you, or right. So that, that made it, a few things kind of jumped out as you're talking there. Like um, one of the things um, uh, God tells us in His Word is that. There is no temptation that's not common to man. Mm -hmm. So none of us are going through something that nobody else has ever gone through. And he also tells us that he always gives us a way out. So mm -hmm. in your, we, we allow Satan to do stuff. Mm -hmm. Throws a temptation over here. God allows him to sift us. And he throws a temptation over here. God's trying to strengthen us. Mm -hmm. And... So in our humanness, we're not going to be, we're not going to be able to, um, avoid that temptation because Satan's not stupid. He, he knows what is going to be tempting to us, something that we're want going to want to partake in and something that we're going to want to do. Mm -hmm. He's not going to, he's not going to, Hey, here, here, Christian, I got this for you. How about, do you want to be a devil worshiper? <laughs> he's He's going to throw something at us that's tempting to us, but it's not something that's not common to other people. And he always gives us a way out. And next, the other thing is, like we've talked about before, that was like a big revelation, is that right now, these disciples are before God has put the Holy Spirit inside of them. Because the Peter here was way different than the Peter that was given the mm. the um, the um, message on the day of Pentecost after mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit came and Jesus actually told him, don't go out don't go out until I send you the counsel of the Holy Spirit because that's going to give you the power to be my witnesses mm -hmm. to the ends of the earth and then another thing because I saw kind of in my <laughs> in my note here uh, Satan sift you as wheat. Jesus' statement concerning Peter reveals two important truths. One, God allows Satan to tempt and test us only within certain limits and by God's permission. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, Job mm -hmm. <laughs> notes, the devil is not free to do what he wants with God's people. Mm -hmm. Two, Jesus prays that the faith of his people may not fail. As our heavenly intercessor, he prays for all who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them, Hebrews 7.25. God is faithful in all our temptations to provide a way of escape, 1 Corinthians 10.13. However, the fulfillment of Jesus' prayers are conditional. If a person rejects the grace of God, Christ's intercession is then of no effect see verse 1941 note so there you know not taking the help that god's given us mm -hmm. and saying mm, i think i'm gonna eat of the forbidden fruit and because this seems good over here oh so a couple of things that um i was thinking of a couple analogies because sometimes thinking of Satan sifting us, we as humans would rather just avoid the sifting process. But there is strength, spiritual strength, that comes from that sifting process. Much like, for instance, I was thinking about 
um, in my health journey wanting to stay away from sugar. I can just kick all the sugar out of the household, but there's strength that comes when I have decided, um, much like if I've decided to follow Jesus, then no matter what, I'm going to follow Jesus. And so if I've decided that I'm kicking sugar out of my life, I can go to the grocery store and I can pass by. Buy us those donuts. <laughs> Funny story, that just happened to me the last grocery shopping trip. I will have to say that perhaps the only reason I passed the donut case successfully is because the donuts I liked weren't there. However... <laughs> God gave you a way out. <laughs> and then the other, the other um, sort of picture I was thinking of is like the butterfly, the the caterpillar that goes in and in the and builds the cocoon, and in in the journey is changing and transforming into a butterfly. With but the then, renewing of our mind transform us by the renewing of our mind. But then minds. breaking out of that cocoon takes a lot of um, strength and force, and well, maybe not force, but probably does. But it's a long process for that butterfly to work out of the cocoon. Now, as a human, um, thinking about like maybe sometimes if you think about a parent child relationship and you see your child struggling, you. And let's, you want to protect them. And you want to get, help, them. help them. But they say that, um, I think science scientists say, that if you were to peel back the cocoon for them and, and release the butterfly, the butterfly would not be strong enough to fly. Yeah, they, they, need, they need that process to be able to fly. And that's the same thing for us. We need that process um to to grow spiritually and so um we don't have trials and challenges and tough things we'll just be soft and weak mm -hmm. <laughs> milk toast yeah <laughs> good stuff all right i just checked and we're we're right around an hour's time right now so i mean that was that was pretty exciting stuff Cool stuff. Good conversation. Getting in God's word again. I think we had a little more to talk about on this part than the contemplating parts that we've been going through. So this this was fun and and awesome to be thinking about some of this stuff. So I think we're gonna going to call it off there until our next study and that one will be starting in 2235. All right, so until then, God bless you guys, and we'll see you on the next Bible study. Dig into God's Word some more. <laughs> see you next time. One second here. Yes, I did push record. <laughs> <laughs> Be oh, okay, start over. There we go. <laughs> that would be terrible. Oh, my word.